as Nigeria's political parties and politicians prepare to go head-to-head -head in the 2023 general election. More and more aspirants are beginning to declare their intention to contest for the presidency. One of such hopefuls is Dele Momodo, veteran journalist, popular newspaper columnist, businessman turned politician and publisher of Ovation International and the online newspaper The Boss. But this will not be Momodo's first attempt at the presidency. In 2011, he made an unsuccessful bid for the post on the platform of the National Conscience Party, NCP. This time around, Momodu has joined the main opposition People's Democratic Party, where he intends to participate in a hard-fought contest to secure the ticket of the main opposition party. Now joining us in the studio to tell us why he wants to become Nigeria's president and how he intends to secure victory during the PDP presidential primary is Dele Momodu, CEO and publisher of Ovation International and the Boss newspaper. Good morning, uh, Bob D, as he's uh, popularly known, and thank you very much for joining us. Dr. Ruben Abati, PhD. <laughs> thank you for declaring for me. You see, Ruben has virtually <laughs> made a declaration on my behalf. Thank you. And well, since you want me to declare, so I might as well declare right here. Mm -hmm. Let me say I am very ready. Uh, I always tell people it's impossible for you to be the president of a country as big, as diverse, as complex, as complicated as Nigeria if you've not prepared for it. Most of the people we have as politicians never prepare for anything. All they prepare for is the next election. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? How are we going to rig? But I can tell you that I've followed the template, okay? of my adopted father, Chief Monsieur Dabiola, I studied him as a book. I can do a PhD on it, and I can see that the reason we're in this mess is that you have leaders who are not accomplished. All over the world, it's not about your age, it's not about your tribe, it's not about your religion, it's about your personal accomplishments. And where you have leaders whose accomplishments you cannot understand, you cannot verify, then you are going to have problems. So, for me, I am tired of just sitting down and lamenting, which is what we know our best to do in Nigeria. Everybody laments, everybody grumbles, everybody groans, everybody moans. But to do what is needed, no. I can tell you that 11 years ago, about 11 years ago now, I decided to contest on the platform of NCP. And the only lesson I learned then was that I was contesting a national election from a fringe local party, which had no capacity to win the election. I went back, and the same thing happened to Chief Abela in 1981, when MPN frustrated him out of their party. He wanted to be president. They saw it. They frustrated him. He left. He came back 12 years after. He was better prepared. In 2023, it will be 12 years since my last attempt. I'm better prepared, and I'm ready. Well, what are you likely to do differently this time? I know there is a book that already documented your experience. I think that's by your former assistant, uh, Uimai uh, Amaze. Am yes. And uh, in that book, some of the things that you have talked about, how you didn't even get the support of your constituency, how mon uh, that's the media, you know, how money uh, is such a big issue in uh, Nigerian uh, politics. So over this period of uh, 12 years, yes, you said you've seen that it's uh, the big platform that is important, that is better. So you've joined the PDP. But how about those other details about money? Because uh, you can't even run for primaries in Nigeria uh, if you don't have uh, cash. And you are a newcomer to the PDP. What gives you the confidence that they will give the ticket to a newcomer. Chief Abela was a newcomer in 1993. He joined SDP two months to go. The chairman of the party, Babagana Kingibe, was interested, was contesting. Alhaji Atiku Abubaka was contesting 29 years ago. And Chief Abela came, joined. The first thing you need to prove to the party is that you can win them the ticket. Any serious party that wants to win election will not just go and pick 
someone who does not have that global appeal. If you do that, you know that you've already lost that election. So today, I don't need to do anything other than to be scientific. The world has moved on, except our politicians. It is important for you to be able to prove to your party your capacity, and that's the job. The main job between now and whenever the, uh, the primaries will take place is for you to show clearly your ability to win them the election. And in my own case, I don't have to travel far. From my telephone, I can show my party my foot soldiers across Nigeria. It's scientific. Every major township, every major village, there are people that we've empowered. Even the government today, if they talk about poverty alleviation, ask them to come and show who and who have benefited from it, they can't even show it. We have so much that we're doing. It's not on television that will reveal our strategy, but I can tell you that we're better prepared. Well, joining the PDP and throwing your hat in the race, you're joining quite a crowded field. You have those agitating for a president of Igbo extraction. You have your political juggernauts like Atiku Abubakar, who has contested several times and come close. You have Bukola Saraki. Those are two northern candidates I could mention. What are you going to use to convince people like those people to support you? Well, the first thing is that Politics and elections are about elimination series. I call them elimination. People are going to sit down and say between Delhi and Elijah Atiku Abubakar, who do we think stands a better chance? Between Delhi and Rabi Ukwankwaso, who do we think is better? Between Delhi and Aminu Waziri Tambua, who do I think so it's a game. Is it until you sit back and you begin to ask questions? What are the youth of Nigeria saying today? That we're tired of the old politicians. We're tired of the old politicians. So if you are tired of the old politicians, you now have somebody who has built a global brand for over a quarter of a century. You are talking about a man who played a major role since 1983 in the affairs of Nigeria. You see, what happens in Nigeria is that Nigeria is the only place I know that it is how long you have contested that matters. It is not how well you have done. So when you talk about all my leaders that you've mentioned, they've all done their best. Like Buhari will say, just, you know, uh, <laughs> to, to, to borrow those words from Buhari, they've all done their best. The time has come for them to give Nigeria a deep breath of fresh air. It is very important. And that has happened elsewhere. It happened in America, where they brought Donald Trump, who was not in politics. It happened even in South Africa. Uh, Nelson Mandela came out of prison. Uh, the, the Rafa Mosa, the man who is there now, was not a hardcore politician, though he was a member of, the, of, the, of their national party. But he was a businessman. He was a billionaire who came out and threw his hat in the ring and did it. If you look at the Prime Minister of Canada, it's a young man, he was born in 1971. <laughs> by the time he was 42, he was already leader of his party. By 44, he was already Prime Minister. Nigerians must learn to do things differently. But I understand your concern. Your concern is captured in the book by the Brazilian author, Paulo Freire, in Pedagogy of the Oppressed that the oppressed people have one fear, is the fear of the oppressor. The oppressed people respect one person, is the oppressor. In Nigeria, people are so afraid that those who have amassed wealth will come to use the wealth to hang on to your necks perpetually. And that's what we see today. But in terms of achievement, in terms of accomplishment, in terms of knowing what to do, you see, you cannot give what you don't have. Politics is not about I've just been in power or where I come from or your religion. It's about managing people and resources. How many people in politics today have managed people and resources successfully? Okay, I mean, great insights you've shared uh, from Ramaphosa to you know a lot of people. Uh, but a lot of people argue that, that Ramaphosa was not necessarily a newcomer, you know, in South Africa. He had been in the trenches, you know, since 
the apartheid days and the 80s. In fact, he was the leader of the, of the Mines Union. But it's good you talked about oppression. I think it was Stephen Biko that said that the most important tool in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. How are we going to change the mindset of Nigerians that have been constantly oppressed over the years? And secondly, based on your empirical stratification, what is the most important problem facing Nigeria as we speak today? Fantastic. You just confirmed what Paul Freire said about the oppressed. The best way to change the mindset of the oppressed is by bringing someone who is bold enough to challenge that status quo. There is no country in the world that things ever changed if one man was not ready to make the necessary sacrifice. Tifabela made that sacrifice. So that's that. The biggest problem facing Nigeria today is lack of unity. I tell people, anybody can build roads, but if you have a leader who does not have the mindset of uniting the country, that's why you find everybody saying, I'm Biafra, I'm Yoruba nation, I'm this, because you have leaders who just don't believe in one Nigeria. And I'm a child of diversity. My father came from a Joe state, south-south, married my mother in Ilefe from Bangon, in Oshun state, southwest. Today, I'm one of the closest people you will find in Igbo land. I mean, if you, have you been following me on social media, I am the only person ever mentioned by name, Damazi Namdikanu, that this is a man who speaks the way a Nigerian should speak. That he says he will turn the Southeast into a technological orb, a Silicon Valley. And that if this is how the other leaders were speaking, we will not be agitating the way we are. So you just need someone who can turn the, the, the depression, the frustration, just turn it around. Bring joy back to Nigeria, I like to say. Bring joy back to the country. The country is in a depressive mood. I have not seen any of the leaders you have mentioned who has that kind of diversity. If you look at my son's name, my son's name is Momodu. My grandparents were Muslims. My parents were Christians. So I understand the, the, you know, the, the dynamics of those sentiments. Because in Nigeria, it's always ethnicity, religion, and of course, loads of cash. On all three accounts, I may not have my own personal cash, but I've worked most of my life with those who control the economy of Nigeria. That's important. If you're not a businessman, you may not know how to even manage resources. A man who never managed one million, you now give him 10, mil 10 trillion to manage. <laughs> He's going to find it difficult. A man who has no knowledge about how to turn one naira into 10 naira, it's going to be difficult to give, to hand over a country to such a person. Well, uh, Bob D, two quick things. One, why the PDP? Why not the APC? Because in 2015, uh, you were pro APC, you were pro Buari, and shortly after that administration came to office, you were publicly seen visiting the president. Uh, you're presenting your books to him and all of that. What happened? You know, how and why did you part ways with your friends in APC? And then on Saturday, you wrote a, a column, back page of uh, this day, in which you were talking about the owners of Nigeria. We're running a democracy. Is there any sort of thing as people who own Nigeria? Doesn't Nigeria belong to all of us? I know you mentioned some names, but they have just one vote, just like the rest of us. Not so. uh, Ruben, mm. you know better. And, but let me start from Buhari. When I supported Buhari, I was not a member of APC. In every election, there are usually two main contenders. And it was between Buhari and your former boss, Dr. Goodlock, Jonathan. Our problem then was that we thought we had seen the worst from PDP. I have since apologized for that mindset. We never knew it could get worse. That's one of the shortfalls of democracy, that there are no guarantees 
that the next person will be better than the last person. So I supported Buhari just because it was the option given to us at that time. And when things started going wrong, and I saw the danger signals early enough, I immediately started firing memos at him. That was when he invited me. I didn't go there on my own to jollificate. I went there to talk <laughs> serious. You know, I went there to tell, and mercifully, I was alone with him in the room. And I saw another danger signal. I could see that a lot of his aides, because he had appointed a few of his aides by then. I could see they were afraid. They couldn't go in with me. And the book I was giving to him was not yet a book. I did a horrid compilation of my articles. And I told the president how for five years I was advising President Jonathan as a special advisor, free of charge, I appointed myself special advisor. I was doing your job for you <laughs> by writing every Saturday. And I don't just criticize government, I prefer solutions. So I was doing that for five years. So I quickly did a compilation and gave it to President Buhari, and I said, I'll be doing the same for you. So for me, that is what every patriotic citizen should do. Talk to your leader, speak truth to power. I never quarreled with him. Till today, it's nothing personal. I'm still, I can show you from my emails, I'm still the only Nigerian who is not in government who receives his pictures directly from the presidency. And I post them free of charge again. I advise him free of charge. My biggest problem with him was over the way Nigeria became di divided. I, I didn't expect him to know much about the economy. I thought he would rely on his team, led by the vice president and others. But what did they do? They emasculated the VP. They, you know, they practically went on a binge, on rampage, and doing whatever they liked. So when I saw that his case had become irredeemable, you don't just give up on a leader. I saw that his case has, has become irredeemable, then I looked for the next alternative. And that was Atiku Abubakar presented to us by PDP. Again, I was not a member of PDP. That's how you know principled people. If there are two candidates and you've seen the worst of one, so what other option do you have? You go to the next candidate. I was a member of PDP, I joined the but today I can see that the excuse that will be used in 2023 is that eh, you people didn't offer yourselves, so we use those who are available. I can tell you confidently, there is nobody currently in Nigerian politics today who can say he was ahead of me in politics. By 1983, you are aware, I was private secretary to Chief Akamo Burewo, the then deputy governor of Ondo State. And from that moment, my trajectory is uncommon. And I think it was orchestrated by God himself. Because it is uncommon to find someone who at 23 would work for a deputy governor of the old Ondo state when Ondo was a combination of Ondo and Nikiti. By 25, 26, working for Oni Ofife, about Kwandeshi Jade, in a palace where politicians converge, whether you are of the UPN stock or the MPN, I mean, you know how close Obasidu Ade was to the Aula was. He taught me how to be tolerant. He was also very close to the Shagari people. And we need that at this time in Nigeria. Nigeria is just, <laughs> we're just hanging. So let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. no, uh, sorry, Tundo. I wanted him to talk about those he described on Saturday oh, as the, the owners, owners of Nigeria. Yes. It's it's very very I thought that this country belonged to all of us. <laughs> yes, you see, you have to know your history. In 1998-99, me, I'm one person, the people of Potako called Otok Nadu. I don't just talk. Most Nigerians talk, they don't act. I act. In 1998-99, I was supporting Chief Olufalaye against Chief Obasanjo and a retired army general. I thought Chief Olufalaye, as a banker and economist, would be able to handle Nigeria better. I then suggested to Chief 
that please, if you are picking your running mate, pick a cerebral northerner. And he asked me, who do I have in mind? And I mentioned Dr. Rinwan Lukman, who was at Opec. I was 38 years old. And I spent my own resources, traveled to Vienna to meet with Dr. Rinwan Lukman, who then gave me that insight into the owners of Nigeria. I said, he said, what have you come to do? I said, sir, we want you to be running mate to Chifalaye. Then he laughed, laughed, and then when he calmed down, he said, Dele, thank you so much for considering me, but I can't. I said, why not? He said, because the owners of Nigeria have decided they want to pass on job. Ah, I said, are we not going to have elections? He said, no, it's not about elections. And never and was, was it? You will not, and he mentioned their names. Of all the names he mentioned, only one, they've been alive. And I believe God has preserved them to today so that they will see a change in Nigeria. That's why I appealed to them last Saturday. The only person who has departed us, God bless his soul, is General Wushishi. All the others, General Basajo, General Salami Abaka, General Ibrahim Babangida, uh, Lieutenant General Ali Gusu, uh, Lieutenant General T.Y. Danjuma, they're all around. And I'm sure they too must be tired of what they are seeing. So my, my appeal to them is very genuine, very sincere, very patriotic, that please, we know you have the power. I, I'm sure you heard the story, even in 20. 18, 2019, that PDP was almost picking my brother, Tambua, and suddenly the owners of Nigeria intervened and said they preferred the article, and that's the article be emerged. So you have to understand, a lot of people walk on the streets and go and get PVC. I, I was at an event in Sheraton last night, and they were talking, I said, no, it's not about getting PVC yet. It's about getting the right candidates. Well, Let the young Nigerians fight for the two parties. Right. What I'm doing now is to practice what I preach. But I'm sure you're preaching to the converted. And many of us know about the owners of Nigeria, even though we want to <laughs> act like we don't, we do. But I wanted to go back to this point of unity. It is one of the tragedies that we've seen in recent history in Nigeria, the complete collapse of that unity, really because of all these agitations that were seeing secessionist, self-determination, and what have you. Look at what happened in America with Joe Biden. A lot of people were not thinking Joe Biden was necessarily the messiah, to, co to coin that phrase, but they were like, at least he will unify the country. He has not been able to do so, so far, because it's beyond rhetoric. What policies exactly do you have in mind to unify Nigeria? You see, most things I learned, I learned from your dad. And you know, you and I, we talk a lot privately. It's very easy. What did Chief Abela do? He employed people from everywhere. At Concord, you would think you were in the mini Nigeria. It didn't matter where you came from. That's one. Two, meritocracy. Put merit above ethnic sentiment. If I want someone from Adamawa today, I'm sure I'll find a qualified person from Adamawa but most politicians don't have the patience to search for competent people. That is the problem. The moment you are able to be fair to all, the moment you are able to have competent, nobody will complain. Since I joined PDP now, you see a lot of people who used to shout Biafra, Biafra on my social media pages. Now they say, ah, maybe there is hope after all. Nigerians love Nigeria. All you know is when they are playing football. But the moment they come back and they see that they said somebody has just been shot somewhere, they arrested him, somebody phones, they release him, nothing is going to work. Trust me, I have the capacity. I've worked across Nigeria. I've worked beyond Nigeria. Nigerians will begin to have renewed hope in their country. The first thing you must offer them, that's why your dad's mantra was hope. If you don't give hope to a people, they will continue to agitate. It's very important, it's clear. You must give them hope, you must give them confidence that you are here for them, that every inch of Nigeria belongs to Nigerians. Okay. Uh, so two questions. You've been able to state that they're owners of Nigerians, Nigeria as a whole, and you mentioned their names. You've been able to state your antecedents. Some other people will argue that that's exactly the problem as regards your candidacy, because you are friends with these owners of Nigeria, and the thoughts of these owners of Nigeria are at variance with the common man that finds it difficult to eat on the streets of Nigeria. So a lot of people see, see you as part of them. One, what you're going to be asked is that. And secondly, you said give Nigerians hope. 
will hope reverse the 15% inflation rate, would hope reverse close to 40% unemployment rate, would hope reverse high debt to service ratio in Nigeria. What are you doing specifically as regards this problem of economy we have on ground? Let me speak to you about, first about the question about friendship. How many people criticize their friends in power? When Dr. Ruben Abati was in, part, uh, in power, I, I, I believe I'm one of the closest. I'm going to put you I, on the I spot. Wasn't in power. I you was, were in power. Uh, I was a messenger. You were not only in government. <laughs> you were not only in government. You were in power. I looked him straight in the eye, and I criticized him. For on one occasion, he overreacted. We had to settle it as on my late, later. He overreacted. He couldn't take it any longer. That's how you know a serious candidate. A candidate is that man who can look at anyone, be you Babangida, be you Obasanjo, and say, sir, what you are saying is wrong. I've always had the record of that. Even my father, my royal father, you remember my spat with the late Oni officer, Oba Kwadishi Jwade, when he said Babangida was making sense. I, I, I couldn't sleep that night. I came out. I came out smoking. I had to go and prostrate later. I mean, as a custodian of tradition to apologize to the elder. But the truth is, I said my mind. I always, that's why I've been in opposition all my life. God preserved me for this role, trust me. There are not many Nigerians who can stand up and will not be afraid that the year, you saw how when Buhari came, how they were harassing journalists. Even him, they harassed, who was not a journalist. He was just doing his job, as he said. Did you see my name anywhere? No. Because everything I do, I do on principle. When you talk about hope, the last thing you lose before you die is hope. Nigeria needs hope first. There is no magician who will come and change Nigeria in two months. But the first thing is I can tell you when Buhari came, people thought he was serious. A lot of people, even I remember my driver in London, you won't believe it. The guy was from Afghanistan. He said, I hear you now have a good leader in Nigeria. You see, there is a way. Hope radiates across everywhere. When you give people hope, then they are ready to make sacrifice. They are ready to do what you ask them to do. They are ready to pay their taxes. Yeah, they are ready. Hope fix the problem. Uh, that's, no, so, that's a problem. So what I'm telling you is that the first thing is to get the right mood. The atmosphere in Nigeria now is so fouled up that nobody even believes in Nigeria. Those who have little money in Nigeria would rather take it elsewhere to go and invest. So that is the word hope. For me, the first thing we will do is to make sure that we have a star-studded cabinet of people of ideas. Everywhere in the world, even you will see that in America, where they are doing most of their debates, they t take it to one campus or the other. It's not like Nigeria, where you have to go to Transcorp building, one of the best hotels. No, they, why? Because the intellectual base of a country is what determines how serious you are. You must seek help from your brightest brains, and we have them. We have them everywhere. Go and get a good team. At Ovation, when we started in 1996, they told us, oh, it will not survive six months. One. No, we promised that we will do it. What, have, what has sustained us is the fact that we were able to get a good team. We maintain a good team. We get the best printers. We get the best cargo company. You must run. The next president of Nigeria must be the CEO of Nigeria. And he must be a brand manager. Because Nigeria needs rebranding. If that's what hope means, if you don't have a leader who knows how to manage people and resources and just bring a politician, they will come, share all the portfolios, then you wait and cry for another three, four years, become again, well, same process. We have less than two minutes to go, but there was a subject we discussed earlier, organized labor protesting the removal of fuel subsidy. Do you support the proposed removal of fuel subsidy? You see, it's always been a very delicate question which I've asked a lot of people in the industry. And it's one of the issues I'm going to address moving forward in the next couple of weeks. It becomes very difficult for me to understand what the subsidy is. When, for the past three or four governments, they've always said they want to remove subsidy. And they will remove. They will remove. What I understand about the oil economy is that all over the world, 
they look at the rates. Let's say today, the, uh, the, the dollar, maybe a barrel of oil is $50. Then it will reflect on the pump price. Tomorrow, if it goes up, it reflects on the pump price. When it comes down, it, but in Nigeria, whatever goes up, never comes down. Because we work against the law of gravity in Nigeria. Everything that goes up just stays up. So that is why you will need the experts to sit down and actually look at it. That so how much does it really cost to produce? And then this idea of you must continue to refine oil abroad. Why has it become a jinx? That's one of the promises that we help Buhari to, thinking that Buhari being in that industry previously will understand how to manage it better. And he gave us the hope that it, everything was going to stabilize. So I don't really know where the, what the subsidy is, but the only way for you to know is when they give us the actual price as it comes from abroad and it's reflected on the pump price. And also when finally we can settle everything at home because we love to import what we can produce. That must not continue. Until a leader is ready to do that, then we continue to talk about subsidies, and most of them non-existent. Well, thank you very much, Ari Dele Mamadu, for joining us uh, this morning on The Morning Show. I'm sure there will be other opportunities for, to further discuss Nigeria with you as we move towards uh, 2023.